I'm doing a series of videos here on this page where I just tell different stories of things that happened throughout my shaken baby syndrome journey, which was my daughter was shaken at three months old. She lived for three years and then she passed away due to her initial injury. And so I'm j I have tons of stories that, you know, crazy things that happened and I'm going to share those. So this one specifically is when she was about a year old. So she was shaken at three months old. Then she had some very severe disabilities, several different things wrong, including gastroparesis. So she had GI issues. Well, she was on a 24 hour feeding tube. She couldn't have anything by mouth. And so when she was about a year old, she started <clears throat> to vomit. And this story is Okay, if you're like squeamish or you just don't want to hear something that might be a little bit gross to you, um, you know, about health issues, then you might not want to watch this. But, um, so, she had these GI issues where <clears throat> she would never vomit because nothing would ever go into her stomach because she had a, what you call a GJ tube, which means it bypasses the stomach and goes directly into the intestines. So, she never had anything on her stomach ever. The way that she, her life was sustained was through the feeds that went into her intestines. So um, at around a year old she started vomiting and I knew something was wrong. She never did that and so I called her GI doctor. This was on a Friday evening I believe and I explained or maybe it was a Saturday. So they were closed. I couldn't just take her into her doctor and I said you know she's vomiting this is not normal for her it's yellow like it was a bright yellow color maybe I can add photos to this video but it was like this bright yellow color that also definitely never happened and so it was also coming out of her tube so she had a, a tube that would that would const um, like constantly drain her stomach and so um, nothing would ever come out of that except air. It was to keep the air out of her stomach so she didn't have gas pain. Um, and so that f same yellow fluid was coming out of there too. So I was like, what? This is not normal. So I called the GI doctor and he's like, oh, it's fine. You know, that's normal for that stomach bile stuff to come out and just bring her in on Monday and we'll check her out. And so I was like, okay few hours go by and she starts to have like these very bluish um like uh veins that were popping up like in her chest with her shirt off you know um and so I was like okay I've never seen that either why are her veins like literally just so prominent right now like all this stuff was just you know that when you have that gut feeling like you know something's wrong and you don't know what you have a doctor telling you that everything's fine that that's all normal but you're just like, no, this is my kid. I know something's up. So that was the feeling at that point. So um, those those veins just really got to me. Um, so I called back and said, I just, I think I need to take her in. I think something's wrong with her, which they again tried to reassure me. Everything's fine. You don't need to take her, but we'll go ahead and call to the ER if you want to take her and let her, let them know that you're coming. So in the middle of the night, I had to call my mom and say, I've been at work all day. I worked as a licensed massage therapist at the time. I'm exhausted. I did like, you know, five or six massages that day. And I was just so tired. I, I felt like I couldn't even carry her, you know, into the ER by myself. Um, and at the time I was a single mom. So I had to have, I believe my aunt come to stay with my older daughter. And then, you know, these are the single mom struggles that I went through. And then I had to have my mom come help me to carry in Krista to the ER. So we got there and they were also reassuring me nothing was wrong. And at this time, she had these big dark circles under her eyes. She was just very lethargic. She was still vomiting that yellow, bright yellow um, fluid stuff. And um, so they were just like, nothing. we can't find anything. There's nothing wrong. We've done... Um, blood work which was very difficult because her body was like you know they, they just could hardly get any blood out of her because her body was so in distress even though they didn't realize that and they did I think like a CT scan or an x-ray or something and they're like we just don't see anything we don't see anything in her stomach everything seems fine and at that point her stomach was distended too like it was growing 
and they were still trying to tell me nothing was wrong. So they put us in a room, they're like, well, we'll just keep an eye on her. So they put her, put us in this regular, you know, room where they could just keep an eye on her. And so by morning time, when we were finally kind of like resting or trying to, they come rushing into the room saying that she has to go for a stat, a stat CT scan because she is in organ failure and that if you know that they were probably going to have to do surgery immediately okay so here we are we going from nothing's wrong we can't find anything you know basically why are you here to oh yeah there is something wrong and so now they're rushing her out of the room they're trying to get an IV in her because her body is just in such you know chaos that it's hard to get an IV or yeah an IV um so as they go out to do the CT scan they they bring her back and there's doctors anesthesiologists with them as they bring her back and they're coming up to me with a piece of paper saying our uh, the here is what's going on she has um like her bowels are so enlarged that it's pushing on all her organs causing her organs to say like they're an organ failure and that's what's causing her belly to distend and it's also pushing on her lungs causing her breathing to have some breathing issues and we have to operate right now we'll probably cut out almost all of her intestines and so that then on this um, anesthesiology sheet they circled death and said I want you to know this is most likely the outcome like you need to know that you're signing this saying that she probably will die during this surgery and so I'm like okay you know I knew something was wrong but not this like I didn't expect to come in here and be told she's gonna die um so she's over there just trying to fight for her life she always fought for her life there was never a time that she was just like I'm just gonna give up and die she tried to fight which is also why I fought for her and didn't just let her lay there and die which is what a lot of people suggest like why did you keep her alive for three years if she was just gonna suffer and stuff but she was fighting to live so I wasn't gonna take that from her so anyway they let him do the surgery I didn't want her to just lay there the the alternative to doing that surgery would have been just letting her lay there until her intestines got so swollen they basically exploded and smothered her through squishing her lungs so people don't understand when they like say things like well you know how could you keep her alive how could you as if i have the power to give life and death but anyways so back to the story um she goes in for this emergency surgery and during that time, you know, they, they were saying they, they were going to cut out basically all her intestines. So she was going to have a, like, stoma, I guess it's called, um, to where they, it would, like, all her bowel movements and stuff would then go into a bag because she wouldn't have any intestines. Um, so during the surgery, we were out, we were just waiting. Uh, it was on, like, a Saturday or Sunday, so they had to be called in to come do this surgery. No one else in the waiting room for surgery. And... You know, throughout that time, I'm just thinking, like, I don't want to leave here. Like, I don't want her to suffer. I don't want her to, to you know, live this way. I don't want to have to, you know, see her like this. I don't want her to suffer. But if she wants to fight to live, then I want her to live. And I just kept picturing myself walking out of the hospital with an empty car seat, with her car seat that I brought her in. You know, I was walking out with it. And I was like, I don't want that. I really don't. Like, this is very difficult. This is so hard. You know, at that point, it had been a year since she was shaken. And, you know, I hate to see her suffer. But I also, at the same time, did not want to leave that hospital without her in that car seat. And, you know, that's a hard place to be in. But then when we were, like, praying over her, I, you know, went to God and said, God, you know what's best for her you care about her more than I do, and this is your daughter, ultimately. You know, you have given her to me, and you've blessed me with her here on earth, but she is yours, and you know what's best, and you know what to do in this situation, and so I want your will to be done here. 
I know that if she passes away, it'll be the best thing for her. I know that if she lives, it'll be because she fought, she wanted to live and fought to live and you, you know, allowed her to do so. Um, but you know, also God doesn't cause bad things to happen. So he doesn't, you know, he never caused what happened to her in the first place. And so it wouldn't have been his fault if she passed away from that because he didn't shake her. My ex-husband did. So I also knew that information. Um, but, you know, I also felt anger in that moment towards my ex-husband, her biological father, because I was like, you deserve to be here. You deserve to be the one getting this surgery. You deserve to, to, to be in this pain. You know, it was just all these emotions because I hated his guts at that time and I talk a lot about forgiveness on here and this is another time that you have to forgive over and over because it it, the trauma is brought back up and the things don't just disappear just because you forgive bad things still can happen and so I had to you know work through that as well being angry at him and then also he did show up to the hospital later and I'll get to that part um, so she made it through the surgery. The surgeon comes out, says that he, it wasn't as bad as he thought it was, but it was still pretty bad and she could still die. And pretty much, oh my gosh, there's a squirrel like trying to get into the car. Okay. Sorry. Um, so if a squirrel jumps in here, but okay, I'm getting distracted. Um, so they cut a piece, they, they cut the dead parts of her intestines out. So she apparently had some infection in her intestines. No one knows how it got there or anything, but they had to cut that out. And so apparently, you know, when you mess with the intestines, you cannot just put them back because they do something called sludging. And I know this is gross, but um, you can't just sew them back together. It takes time to heal. They have to heal first before you can sew them back together. So he was like, okay, so here's what we had to do. We took, and get ready for this. This is kind of vulgar. We took her intestines. We, we've cut a, cut down her stomach. We've taken her intestines out and put them, oh my gosh, this is why I'm distracted. Um, and put them into a bag. Um, I gotta roll this window up. I'm too afraid this is gonna get in my car. We've put them in a bag. I'm sorry, I know this is a serious conversation. But we've... And the reason they're in a bag is because they have to heal before we can put them back together. I'm rolling the windows up. Um, so, they had to put them... Like I said, out into this bag, okay? And it was a very terrible sight. And it was very, you know, as bad as it sounds. Because that sets you up for infection big time whenever that's just there like that. And um, that had to stay that way for, I think it was like three weeks maybe before they could go back in and sew them back together. So she survived. They said several times throughout that time, those three weeks in the ICU, that she probably was going to die that day. And so you can imagine the trauma and the emotions that I had to go through. Just, um, you know, hearing that. Oh my gosh, this is like driving me crazy. hearing that over and over again that your child is going to die today and then you they don't it's just like so traumatizing um but god helped me through that i relied on him and he got me through that very difficult time and also having to be away from my older daughter for i think it, it was a total of 89 days that we were in the hospital and so i had to have help with her i had to yeah it was it was a very difficult time. Um, so she survived. They eventually were able to sew it all back together, sew her stomach back together. And, oh, I left out the most dramatic part here. Her biological father comes to the hospital. So I did keep him updated some about what would go on with her. 
and especially times within the hospital because number one I wanted him to know what he caused number two just felt like it was the right thing to do um so he shows up at like 10 p.m that same day that all this happened so she had the surgery I was told she's gonna die and so there was something going on and yeah he definitely showed up at the very like wrong time but right time for him I guess because in the ICU there's a there's like one little period of time that you can't be in the room and you go out into the, like the lobby okay and it's for like 15 20 minutes or something while they're doing their you know switching nurses um so I happened to be out there at like I don't know what time it was something was going on with her I can't remember what they were doing but something to where they were like um we need the room to be cleared maybe it was just an x-ray I can't remember so the room had to be cleared so I was out in the lobby of the ICU well he comes walking up there and this is like at night I was exhausted I was supposed to be just out in the lobby for a few minutes and go back in there and go to bed so I'm completely exhausted he comes walking in there at like 10 p.m okay all this happened first thing in the morning he knew about this all day long he shows up at 10 p.m. and he's in there just with a complete attitude, I guess is the, the easiest way to say it, the nicest way. Um, he's going on and on. He's saying all this crap about me. And I asked him to call security for him, for them to come tell him to leave. I'm like, you can't show up here at 10 p.m. at night. Like, what is wrong with you? you've had all day long I told you about this a long time ago you don't get to just come up in here like this so at that time he technically had rights to her still through the court system but he didn't have any custody so it was like a difficult you know situation but um a tricky situation for the hospital to be like yeah you have to leave but you do have rights to her at the same time so that was bad that was a very annoying thing because I think they did let him go in and see her for a minute and then he had to leave because it wasn't visiting hours or something like that so anyways he came in there with all that drama you know didn't care at all about what had happened that day to me and so blaming me for what happened to her saying I didn't take good care of her all of those things okay so that's that part um so anyways we eventually did go home 89 days later and, you know, I'm trying to work to support my family. I was a licensed massage therapist at the time, so I was trying, which I think I already said that, but I was trying to, you know, I had to provide for us. And doing all that, that was one of the hardest times of my life. Um, I would never want to go back to that time. Um, but, so there's a story with that. She survived it. She never really had any more GI issues after that. She just continued like the same ones where she had to have a feeding tube and all that stuff. And, you know, you never would have imagined something like that. She had gastroparesis. And so a lot of you probably know what that is and maybe you even have it. But, um, so she struggled a lot with her GI system, but never like that again, thankfully. Um, so yeah, there's that story that very traumatic awful story but you never would imagine that these things can happen um just because someone shook a baby okay it led to this like you just don't even think about something like that happening so that's why I'm here to tell these stories because I just want people to see the realities of like being a special needs parent and you know I needed a lot of support a lot more than I received during that time you know if you just take someone a meal if you, like, it makes the world of a difference. If someone's in the hospital and you know that they've been there a while, you know, even a week, at that, at, at a week it starts to get really difficult. Um, they're exhausted. Offer them a break. Ask them if you can go sit with their child. They may not want that, but ask them if you can. And at least being asked makes a difference. And just whatever you can do for them. They need all the support they can get if they're in a situation even just similar to that at all. And... You know, that's why I'm here to talk about this. I want people to know what it's like. And I want people to be able to support other people who, you know, we don't just realize that people are going through this. And so feel free to share this video. Feel free to share any of my videos to help spread awareness about shaken baby syndrome. And thank you for listening. <laughs>